Welcome back, everyone. So anyone who follows my channel or has for any length of time probably remembers when I bought this. I bought this lawnmower back in, um, I think it was spring, like late winter of 2019. So it would have been um, probably March or uh, possibly uh, somewhere in February. I'm not really sure, but I bought it in 2019. It was a leftover from the previous season. Um, this machine was um, never started, never oiled up. I think this might have been the one they had on display, actually. And um, got a pretty good deal on it. I paid uh, about half of its retail price. Um, and it's been a good mower. Um, I'll have to. I, I, I'll, I'll honestly say it's been a good mower for the. See, I used it the season of 2019. 2020. So yeah, I'm, I've actually used it for about three summers. However, that works out. Nevertheless, um, I have yet to sharpen the blade. I have. Um, have to do some maintenance to the drive system and uh, I'm going to take a look at the spark plug and see what we uh, what that looks like now in typical fashion these videos that I make are not quick here's how to fix your mower have a nice day and by the way uh, check out our sponsors now that's, that's not what we do I'm going to talk about a lot of things and uh, these are not quick videos if you're looking for quick answers go somewhere else I get a lot of complaints on my channel for talking too much but on the other side of the coin, I get a lot of compliments for providing more details and insight. So, if you're going to come here to complain that my videos are long-winded, you can kindly fuck off. Um, so, for the rest of you folks, this video is for you. So why don't we get started? Um, this is one of those uh, Briggs & Stratton EXI series engines that doesn't require an oil change. Now, if you're a, a consumer who is not um, savvy with small engines, that might sound like a good thing. That might sound like a godsend. Wow, what sorcery did they did they em employ to make this a, a maintenance-free engine? Well, it really isn't black magic at all. What they're really doing is they're just saying, hey, this engine will live for the warranty period, if you never change the oil. Beyond that, it's not our problem. It's yours. So, <laughs> it's kind of like a, a tongue-in-cheek, yeah, you don't need to change the oil in this engine. Nah, this is modern technology. We use synthetic oil. It never needs changing. Um, listen, if you buy into that, you're going to screw yourself in the end. If you if you are expecting a good long 10 years or so out of this machine and you never change the oil and you have a relatively reasonable sized lawn, you will seize the engine. Even if you just keep topping it off, it will eventually... What's going to happen is if you never change the oil in this engine, it will progressively begin to burn oil. That is how it works. You're, it's not going to seize up. As long as there's oil in there, it's probably not going to seize up but it will progressively begin to burn oil. So for the rest of you folks, <laughs> changing the oil is actually quite easy. There's two ways to do it. Um, I've already done this one. And what I do is I just take the oil cap off, the fill cap, and I tilt the machine on its side with a bucket under it. And that's how I drain it. I warm up the engine first, and then I drain the oil that way. And you just do it right through the... Uh, through the dipstick tube. Now, the other way to do it is <laughs> Briggs & Stratton also sells a device. It's actually, actually, you can buy them at Harbor Freight. It's a suction device that you just pump it up and it sucks the oil into a, into a uh, containment vessel, which you can then dump in your oil waste jug and bring it to any auto parts store or your town or county dump and they will recycle it for you. Um, but if you never change the oil, yes, this engine will probably last a couple of years without an oil change, as long as it's never run out. But again, it will progressively begin to burn oil. 
as the rings wear out from all the contaminants in the oil. The problem with these engines isn't that, well, with any engine, really, um, engines, regardless of what kind of oil you use, they always, it could be the best quality engine ever made, it could be the worst engine ever made. It will wear out, and it wears out as metal, bearing material, cylinder wall material, ring material. It, it, what happens is it starts to contaminate the oil progressively, and that's why we change our oil or, and or oil filters. This engine does not have an oil filter, so those contaminants will continue to circulate and circulate. You're never removing them. You're just adding more oil. And the contaminants aren't what really burns off. It's the oil itself. So, <laughs> listen, pay no mind to the never needs an oil change shtick. What they're really hoping happens is that the engine, by the time the engine burns out, they're going to have a nice electric mower that they can sell you, which is the future. I, however, happen to depend on my gasoline-powered machines because they work. I know how to maintain them. I know how to keep them alive. And I know I can get 15 years out of this machine. And here's how I'm going to do it. Okay. <laughs> so oil change has been done. Um, we're going to take a look at the uh, spark plug. I'm going to write down what plug it has. Um, two years and average use. I use it about once a week throughout the summer months. Um, it's probably due for a spark plug. So we're going to pull that sucker out and see what we got. All right. So you can already see basically what we have here. Yeah, they have this in stock at Home Depot right now. So I'm probably going to zip out after I finish this film, this video. And I'm just going to go ahead and pick one up. But let's just see what it looks like. Check it for wear. There we are. So plug wrench size is going to be 5 eighths. Okay. Pull that out. Now, like I said, I've had this mower for about three summers, and uh, I've had no issues at all with this engine. Um, the only thing I don't like about it is if it hits rough terrain, it tends to choke out, and I'm not really sure why. I have a theory that what's happening is, shit, how, oh, I'm only spinning the insulator. Just put that back in my like, why is this, what is this, like a five inch long thread on this thing or what? So the plug that's in it is a Champion. Let's see, the other, oh wow, okay. Yeah, that, that center electrode is starting to wear. You can see, I can get this in frame. That center electrode is showing a lot of wear. The edges of the electrode should be sharp. And they're definitely not. So this thing's out of spec for sure. I'm going to take this plug with me to Home Depot. And I'm going to just buy a new one. We'll leave that out for now. Okay. Um, one of the things you should do with your lawnmower once a season is check and or sharpen your lawnmower blade. Now, since I am a lazy son of a bitch, I will actually replace the blade. Now, what I like about the Smart Stow is it has kind of a built-in service position, like that. And we can access the underside without worrying about oil and gas spilling everywhere. By the way, this engine has been drained of fuel, so we can actually kind of clean this up. Um, this thing's got a little bit of buildup underneath. I'm not gonna worry about it too much. The uh, the blade, I'm sorry, the uh, the belt uh, for the self propulsion. You change it by removing the blade, and uh, I believe this bottom cover has to come out too. But it's still fine. It's not broken yet, and when it does, I'll change it. Now the blade is duller than oh my god. <laughs> there is no this thing isn't cutting grass. It's mashing it now. Um, a little bit of chips here and there. So what this blade really needs is a needs to be balanced, and it needs to be it needs to be sharpened and then balanced. I'm, I don't have the equipment to do to do that correctly, 
But before you remove the blade, just make a note of the direction. Now, if you have the blade off and you're not sure which direction it goes on, the easiest thing to do is to look at the rope. And uh, with the plug wire removed, oh, wow, that engine looks dirty as hell inside. With the plug removed, you want to pull the rope. Open the bale. And pull the engine over and see what direction. Let me see if I can get that in frame. See how it goes in that direction? Well, that's the uh, where the where the cutting edge of the blade should go, just in case you get lost. Okay, now the fun part. We need to remove the blade. Now, if you don't have air tools, there are methods to doing this um, that don't require air tools. But since I have them, I'm going to use them. A good excuse to buy an air compressor and some air tools if you don't already have them. All right, so we got our blade mount off, and uh, we're going to save that blade. I'm going to I'm going to sharpen it someday. All right. So we know that the engine rotates this way, and you can see how this blade bracket or pulley assembly is shaped in a convex um, fashion. So that goes on like that. All right, we're gonna put the, the impact on a lower setting. And we're gonna just hit it a couple times. That should do her. Now, if you break the bolt, uh, you're, you're screwed yourself. Um, you can still get them out, but I'm not gonna Hopefully that will never happen to me. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab ourselves a, uh, looks like it's going to be 14 mil. No, no, it's actually going to be a 13 or a 12. 13. And this is a personal pace model, which is a self-propelled one. So we're going to have to do something a little bit different with the back of this. Um, so there's going to be a washer here. And the shaft slides out. And it's got really nothing left in there for grease. So we're going to wash these parts with uh, WD-40 and put some fresh grease in there. Grab a rag. Alright. Just going to clean the axles up. Okay. I'm going to show you on one side, then we'll do the other uh, off camera. Want to get inside the, the wheel too, get all that crappy old grease out of there. So you clean the wheel up while you're at it. There you go. Good time to check your wheels for damage, check for cracks, make sure the tires aren't falling off. Held up pretty good. We're gonna clean the washers. Now, if these washers are worn thin, you can replace them. Um, these are here to. Uh, these are actually here to um, keep the wheel from rubbing up against the bracket directly, which is not a good thing. All right. Now, the grease I'm going to use on this just because I have a bunch of it, is Lucas Red and Tacky. I'm sure there are better choices, but I have a bunch of this stuff that I bought for a small project, and I'm just going to use it because I have it. For no other reason than that. You know? It doesn't have to be anything spectacular. 
I believe before I did, I think I used, um, I think I used Silglide when I bought the machine and put it together initially. Silglide works pretty well too, um, but it, I don't think it held up all that well. This wheel here. Now while you're under your mower, probably a good idea to check for any deck damage, any, any cracking, any, any fatigue. Regardless of what kind of mower you have, uh, especially if you have one of the fancy aluminum or composite deck models, you'll want to check for any fatigue cracks uh, because they can they can cause problems down the road. See how smoothly that wheel spins. Listen to that one. Listen to this one. Oh, so nice. Um. All right, the next thing we need to do is we need to take this, this shaft out as much as possible. And what I want to do, oh, I, oh, that's right. I think I sprayed um, fluid film in this machine shortly after buying it. Um, what I'm seeing, I don't think I like, I see there's a little rubber seal that has just kind of fallen off. So that's not a great thing. But let's we'll just see how bad it is. I'm gonna take the uh, the axle nut off. Now this machine has one of the infamous general transmission gearboxes. Now these are high failure rate items, especially if the mower is under any stress, which this one is. So that will probably fail. Probably sooner than I hope. So I got the wheel off. See, there's a lot of shit in there. Look at that. Gross. Gnarly. All right, we'll take the, uh, the uh, axle off. That is disgusting. And this has got some dust and other debris in there. And uh, there's a washer right here in the middle. That may or may, I think that actually came out the last time. Uh, what we need to do is we need to take this whole thing out. Yeah, we need to just we need to take a look at that whole thing. So on these machines, the, uh, the rear wheels are a wear item. Uh, this gear here tends to wear out on these, and uh, that's that is a yeah, these are totally bone dry. So we're gonna definitely <laughs> definitely do this right for sure. Um, put that there. do is remove this may be a little more extensive than I wanted it to be um, but I may have to remove the entire handle housing or handle mount assembly so I might not have I may not be able to do this job in the service position which is kind of, kind of a nightmare but you can definitely tell there's a lot of resistance here because of a lack of lubrication. Um, so it looks like, and I, I thought this was a straight shaft, it looks like it might actually be, um, it might be a differential in there. I did not know that, but it, it looks like that might be the case. There might be an easier way to do this. Uh, if I pull the uh, circ clips off, the gears, I may be able to do this without uh, tearing the wall apart. So there's a little circ clip right here. Can't really see it, but this pops off. 
was shortly after this moment that I realized I had a pair of snap ring pliers, which made the job a hell of a lot easier. But before you guys hammer me in the comments, I just wanted to mention that. Um, use, use snap ring pliers if you got them. It, it really is the right way to do this. I'll do the same thing on the other side. Okay, got the gears off. So now I can get the shaft positioned so that I can get inside there without removing the whole thing, you know? So I can put some grease, I can clean this all up. Get some fresh grease in there. Yeah, that's pretty gross. Clean everything else up while I'm in there. This is, uh, this is regular maintenance that if you do on these machines, you might not have a lot of the problems that these machines are known for. Um, you know, by not lubricating these bearings and not lubricating really all these parts, I mean, the machine has to work just a little bit harder, you know, to do the job. You have to push that handle a little bit harder to overcome the resistance. Now, here's what I'm gonna tell you guys. So when I bought the machine after the first season, um, it was really struggling. Like I couldn't even push it anymore. What happened was, is water got in here from cleaning the machine and it caused it to pretty much seize up. And if I had just pushed the envelope, you know, um, it looks like, oh, these are, these are bearings. That's a bearing. Okay, so as we've learned, there um, the drive shaft bearings are a sealed bearing, um, so they cannot be relubricated, but they can be replaced. They're a three dollar twenty eight cent part. And there's two of them, one on each side, and removal is as simple as removing the handle bracket assembly. As far as I, as far as I can tell from uh, the parts diagram, the part number, by the way, is one zero four eight six. Nine nine, and that is for my machine. Uh, yours may be different, so let's move on with the show. I'll just kind of clean this up a little bit. So no need to put any grease in there, but we still need to grease the axle, and uh, we need to make sure that these are nice and clean for posterity's sake. So I'm going to bring these downstairs. I'm going to clean them with a little bit of a degreaser and we'll clean up the axles make them nice and shiny just like that okay so we're going to put the wheels back on a couple of things you want to do um, i made a, a small mistake could have been bad but these little um these little plastic and or graphite infused hickeys, they actually go um, behind these uh, gears. So we have to take these gears back off and put them in place. My end frame. Uh, there we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do that. Yeah, something didn't seem right to me, and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna double check the uh, parts diagram. They're freely available when you need them. That's always good. Uh, but we're gonna, yeah, I figured it'd be a good idea to just take a look at that parts diagram and see uh, where things are supposed to be, rather than where I think they should be. So we're gonna put these back in, like so. Undoubtedly, one of you guys is going to do this, and you're going to make the same mistake I did. And, uh, it's alright. It's okay. I'll put the circlet back in place. Okay. Ooh, did you guys?
guys hear that? <laughs> Somebody just bent their mower blade. Oh boy. And that leads me to my next point. Caring for your lawnmower, be it gas or electric, starts with prep work. When you're mowing your lawn. Always check for obstacles. There we go. Circle clips in place. We can now put our wheels on. All right. <clears throat> we're gonna do we've already got grease or this wheel's ready to go and we'll just uh, make sure that this, this is a bronze oil light bushing just make sure that's snapped in place first okay it goes on like that and we can clean the wheel up after If you have not drivers using, it just makes the job that much better. That much easier. Just walked those um, the little dust seals off, just like that. It is, we didn't screw it up. I mean, it's, it's how it goes together. <laughs> it'll it'll fall off again. Whatever. The wheels rubbing against the. Interesting. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run over to Home Depot and I'm going to try to find me a belt. Um, should be pretty easy to find, but I feel like, I just feel like it needs to be changed. I feel like um, it's been played and uh, it's time. So we're going to try to find one. Wish me luck. Wouldn't you know it, they actually sell belts for these. Um, and we're going to just, we're going to change it out because why not? So I'm going to go ahead and pull that blade back off. All right. Now, it looks like changing this belt is kind of a bitch. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> No, it's not an easy one to do. But we've got to pull uh, these motor mounts off because oh, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Let's see if we can just kind of go like that. Yeah, that kind of works. But getting it off of the, uh, the gearbox, I have to remove a couple of screws. And it doesn't look like, um, huh. I know there's instructions on how to do this. You just don't have them. Feeling back in there. It looks like you've got to remove a cover that's actually on the gearbox itself. So we have to do is remove the rear baffle. That's this thing right here. And the nuts of that, or the bolts, are going to be up on top. America, goddammit. And it's a three piece. So we'll take these screws off the top here. There we go. Just take these screws off. And uh, might be some more. Let's see how let's see where that gets us. Oh, that 
took care of it right there. Okay. So that gives us a little more access to the belt. And you can see this belt is actually pretty worn out. So this was, uh, this was probably worthwhile, huh? The only other thing is that I've got this little belt cover that I can't seem to get off. Let me get this lead mount off there. So, okay. So we're gonna have to, all right, so according to my sources, okay, so we gotta take this cable stay and we need to uh, pull it up and out of the way. Slip it into this hole. And to do that, it's got these two fingers we have to compress. slide it through that hole. And we should be able to knock the transmission assembly forward. Giving us a little more access to the top. There we go. Ah, there you go. See? And then what you want to do is need, we need a, a square headed screwdriver to take this top cover off, and that's how we're gonna get the belt off. Now, of course, there's, a, there's another one. You know, you save yourself a lot of aggravation by making this part of your um, routine maintenance whenever you do the blade. You know, maybe change out this belt. I'm looking at it now and it doesn't look that bad. But we can compare it to the new one to see how much it's actually stretched. So let's do that right now. Okay. so. It stretched quite a bit, quite a bit, as a matter of fact. That's just normal belt stretch, my friends. Um, so, you know, how much life is left in it, it's hard to say. But, I mean, we're already here, let's just change it at this point. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna put in a new belt and uh, save us some aggravation later. But on a machine like this, this probably should be routine maintenance. And I say that because of how the belt is used. So part of, so the way the speed is regulated on this machine, it, um, it depends on, or it depends on, it relies on a controlled amount of belt slip. So in order for it to run at a lower speed, that's why it's, it's the personal pace, um, you know, personal pace speed selection system. So really all it's doing is it's allowing the belt to slip constantly in order to run at lower speeds, at lower paces. So for it to do that, the belt, like I said, it just, it just has to slip. And what happens when a belt slips? It wears out. Um, so it's just a side effect of, of really the design. It's neither a flaw, but I mean, it, it's not really a flaw. It's just a cost effective way of achieving a, uh, a desired method of operation that comes at a cost of wearing out belts. Nothing wrong with that. And I have no problem paying 17 bucks or whatever 
for a new belt whenever I change out the blade. Not something I'm gonna really worry about. You know, it's the cost of doing business. So I don't think it's a bad design, but it does have its flaws and that's one of them. Now the biggest problem with these machines, as I mentioned earlier, is the gearbox itself. Um, they are a known wear item. They, they do break down with frequency, um, especially in older models. I don't know if uh, this one is going to fail prematurely or not. I suspect it will. You know, but the good thing is, you know, if it does fail, you can still use it like a regular lawnmower. So I just checked the pricing on the transmission assembly, and uh, it isn't that expensive. It's expensive, but um, you can get it from jacksmallengines.com. Um, it is $71.55, part number 1374825, and you're going to want to make sure that that's the right part number for your machine, but it's not $300 or some stupid number like that. It's $71. I mean, eh, it's the price of a Starbucks coffee, you know, whatever, not too bad. Not three hundred dollars. Yeah, definitely, because it's not in the right position. That's okay. That's all right. Want to do what we done did? Dunk it forward. And uh, let's see if we can get it. There we go. Now it's where it belongs. go. Now it's on the pulley. Lock our cable in place. And, uh, shit. <laughs> it looks like it's too small. It's really tight. That's not okay. It's the right part number, correct? And it says it's supposed to be. The original part number is 913253. This is not the right part number. I think it fits 22 inch recycler walk power mowers 2009 and newer. It is a rear drive belt. Rear wheel drive. And the part number on the box is 38991. I think somebody screwed up. Yeah. I think it was I think it was packaged incorrectly. You may have done all this for nothing. How do you like that? <laughs> yeah, there's no way that this is this is not the right belt. It's ratchet drive. Well, <laughs> what a waste of seventeen dollars, my friends. What a waste. It's the wrong belt. Either it was packaged wrong or, well, I'm going to uh, take a picture of the original belt and I'm going to try to find it somewhere else. And I'm going to change it next year. This is going to go back in. We just need to get this uh, back in position. get that screwed in so I just found a little gotcha um, basically if the belt you, when you when you put the uh, fasteners in for this belt cover make sure the belt 
is actually nice and taut because it can get caught on the other side of the fastener. And you probably won't notice it until after you assemble everything. You go to start the motor and the belt just shreds the entire belt cover apart. That is a very real possibility. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna get the, um, there should be a keyway on this, right? Oh, this is nasty. This is really nasty. This is just a sign of the times. So the keyway is welded to the inside of this. If for whatever reason you hit something and that keyway lets go, you have to replace this whole assembly, which is um, really shitty, actually. Um, really, really shitty because it just a key only costs like a buck or two. This, <laughs> you know, they're going to charge for it, and it's not going to be cheap. All right. So the key. Right here, you can see that that's where the key is going to be. So you want your keyway, that slot, to line up with that. Now, as far as getting the belt onto this, this is how we're going to do it. Going to rotate the engine like so. There we go. And that's it. We're done. Relatively speaking. Okay. Lay in our bolt right here. Make sure we get it on right. Spins clockwise or counterclockwise, anti-clockwise for you guys in uh, Great Britain. Um, counterclockwise if you live in the U.S. Okay. The nice thing, I get um, some older mower designs. Um, you could easily put the. I actually had a mower once. It was my first lawnmower. I had it when I was nine. And it knocked. It actually knocked really bad. And, um, but it ran. It still ran. We would just run gear oil in it. It was fine. <laughs> but it knocked. Um, hey, whatever. I was nine. <clears throat> so, anyways, that mower, uh, somebody put the blade on backwards. Because back in the day, um, they would be completely flat. And this is this is um, set up like a like an aircraft prop. It's bent, so it lifts. It has nice suction to send the uh, the, the debris into the bag. Well, anyway, this machine um, it just had a flat blade, and it was a, just a side discharge. And what happened was, yeah, somebody didn't know how to put the blade back on. They put it on backwards, so it was actually cutting on the trailing edge of the blade. Not a good, not a good scenario. Tight enough. Yeah, that's good. It ain't going nowhere. <clears throat> that's it. So we're done. We're done underneath. So it's going to be like that. Okay. Got all that stuff back together, all that for nothing. But we got what we needed done. We got the blade done. Now we gotta do some stuff on the top. Get that piece of wood out of my way. Okay. So we got our new spark plug. We're gonna look in the manual and see what the plug gap should be. And we're going to set the gap on this new plug. Now, this is a, this is one of their new Long Life or Platinum. Looks like a Platinum tip plug. You can tell by the size of the tip on there. Um, so we're going to set our plug gap. Okay, so our engine is in the Model 10,000 family. Hundred sixty-three cc. Spark plug gap, thirty thousandths of an inch. All right, just for fun, I'm gonna take a look at the old plug and we're gonna see how that compares to what it should be. Now, I believe I actually checked and adjusted this plug last year, so it shouldn't be too far off. So, 
We're going to find 30 thousandths on our feeler gauge set. There's 32 thousandths, 30 thousandths. These are kind of kind of weak. 0.030. That's 30 thousandths. Our original plug is perfect. Our new plug is perfect. 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 I like it. So we'll put it in. This is a Briggs and Stratton brand plug. It's probably just a rebadged champion or some shit. The original plug was a champion. I've heard a lot of bad things about champion plugs lately. Their quality has gone down the toilet. Um, they're made in China. They're garbage. This one is probably also made in China, but it's got gold plating on it, so it's got to be good, right? Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a real spark plug. Oh, wait a minute. This new plug has a completely different, uh, different plug wrench size. This is a smaller one. Okay, so let's set that up. Easier to do in service mode when the uh, when the engine's sitting at an angle like this. You just kind of drop it in there, put it in by hand. Okay. You know, most of the folks my age, if they if they do own homes or they do maintain their own yards, they're probably going to buy electric machines. So this is probably useless information to handle in. Okay, rolls nicer. Briggs and Stratton has managed to figure out how to design the best air filter money can buy. No, really. <laughs> Um, these air filters are so easy to change out, it's just crazy. Just pop this cover off. Oh, look at that. Nasty. And the new one. And you're done. I could probably stand to clean this out a little bit. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe I won't. You're not the boss of me. I've already cleaned the intake on this uh, about a month or two ago, um, but this thing does, it, a lot of dust gets in there. But look at these new air filters, they, they just snap in, done, done, no more, no more dicking around. I will say that I kind of miss the old sponge filters. Um, they weren't as effective, I think, as these are, but um, they were easy to maintain. And you can get years, years of operation out of one of the original sponge filters. Idiot. Yeah, many years. <clears throat> Come on now. There we go. And that's it. Now the ready start engines, um, they actually have an automatic choke. And that's how they, uh, that's what makes them easy to start. And, you know, I was surprised to find that the automatic choke is actually driven off of a bimetallic spring, which mounts to the exhaust. And over here. I don't think you can see it. Oh, there it is. This guy right here. It's a bimetallic spring, and what it does is it responds to the heat coming off the muffler, and that's how the choke is open and closed. So when it cools down, the spring retracts, choke clo uh, opens, uh, closes. 
when it warms up. I thought initially that these engines had a choke that was um, that operated off of um, the uh, flywheel, um, the air coming off the fly, but like a flag. That is not the case. So I thought I'd point that out. I do believe these still have a flag that controls the um, the governor, but that's all. So the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to blow off, the, blow off some dust, and I'm going to clean the machine with a little bit of um, waterless car wash stuff. And uh, I think this cover has come loose. Yeah, there's a screw under here. Take a look at that screw. Nope, just a just a little hook. So that's fine. Water got in here and here when I was washing it, and it rusted those screw heads. But that's okay. So, and that is how I maintain my mower. Um, any questions, comments, suggestions, or you just want to plain bitch me out because I didn't do something? You know where to leave them. All right, so um, before I go, fluid film, great stuff. What I do with this is I spray it down in here and in here. What that does is it keeps the personal pace control bar nice and lubricated. The stuff sets up pretty nicely as a kind of a greasy film. It also smells all kinds of agricultural, you know. Kind of evokes the um, Green Acres vibes, you know. And what we should also do is uh, throw some lubricant down in those, um, not this stuff, but some other, you can use cable lube. Uh, there's other stuff you can try to lubricate the cables, which need to be regularly lubricated for the smooth operation of your lawnmower. But this right here, you want that to move nice and smoothly, and that's to keep the, um, the drive speed regulated properly. You don't want it binding up. So this moves nice and freely. So this thing doesn't this thing doesn't sit outside. It you know it gets parked in the garage, you know, when it's being used. Um, never ever use WD-40. No, 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 no. <laughs> WD-40 is bad. Um, what you want to use, um, there's some three-in-one oil here. We can use that. That works pretty well for cables. So we'll, uh, we'll do that. But no WD-40. WD-40 is bad. It is not a lubricant. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they say. It is not a lubricant. Oil is. And just a few drops every couple minutes. You know, that's all it really takes to keep that cable lubricated. It's kind of the uh, recommended way to do this. Um, so I've, I've found is you take the cable and you tie a bag of oil around it, nice and tight. Take a sandwich bag and you hang it up by the sandwich bag with the cable going down, and that oil will gradually drip through the cable sheath. And all, you know, it'll, it'll keep it nice and looped. But this takes a lot of patience, a lot of time, a couple of drops, work the cable back and forth, a couple more drops, work it back and forth, and it'll get down. The oil will follow the spiral of the cable um, sheath. You can see the spiral shape right here. It's made out of basically spring steel. And you want that oil to just kind of follow that spiral all the way down. So now the lawnmower is all ready to go for next year. Now for some more pressing matters. This snowblower we're going to be needing actually probably sooner than I, than I anticipate. So what we're going to do oh, is uh, probably an 8 or a 10 millimeter. So what happened was um, last year... Oh, really? Ah, there we go. Last year, we had a little situation where the uh, starter cord was starting to fray and it snapped. And I had to get the machine running 
quickly because we had a snowstorm. So I uh, I used what cord was left and just kind of made it work. Well, I mean, it's just barely enough cord. Well, who am I kidding? It's enough cord to start the machine, but it's um, still a little bit too short for me. Uh, the cord should be longer than it is. So we're going to replace the cord completely. So I went out and I bought some new uh, some new starter cord. And we're going to pop it in. This is a job that's a lot easier uh, when the um, cord isn't already snapped. <laughs> so, anyway. Let's see where we're at right now. So right now, there's about three and a half feet or so of, uh, of cord in there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wind it up a few more turns. So the spring hasn't broken yet, that's good. So we're gonna wind it up a few more turns. I'm gonna take this knot out. Let me get something in there to uh, prevent it from letting loose. This should do the job, right? This, uh, this paintbrush. And yeah, that does the job pretty well. All right. I actually got pretty good at doing these when I was a kid because of all the crap lawnmowers that I had available to me for my little lawn mowing business. Um, I kept breaking cords left and right. I mean, these machines were worn beyond belief. So I was always fixing starter ropes. You can buy these universal ropes at Home Depot, uh, Lowe's, um, your local art hardware store. Um, now this one here, yeah, it's about the length it should be, whatever length that is, does it say? 88 inches of number four solid nylon cord. Good enough for me. So we're gonna wind this thing up a few a few times here so that it has enough spring tension to bring it all back in. All right. So we gotta find the, uh, there it is, there's the entry. So it lines up like this. So you want to line up this hole right here, which is uh, where the where the knot goes to the um, to the loop. Not to the loop. What did I say? That's not what I meant. But you know what I mean. Line it up real good. And we're gonna fish this in here. Hopefully, get it to to go in. And it's probably too big of a big of a knot for that to work. I'm gonna have to probably thread it through somehow. Here, I'll take some of this smaller thread, right? Maybe this will work for us. No, huh? I'll think of something. It's roughly the same diameter as the original, but um, here, you know what I need to do? Is I need to uh, cut it with a knife. Use a razor blade. And we'll just kind of give it a nice point and see if that gets us anywhere. Uh, we're trying to guide it into a hole that we have no access to. All right, let me, um, let me singe this. All right, so I singed the rope, and then I used my fingers to kind of get it down to a point. Like that. There we go. Now, see there's a little ramp right here to guide the rope. 
That's very nice. Very nice. All right. Um, I don't recommend doing that because you could burn yourself. Uh, just a little disclaimer. Uh, you could easily burn yourself, and nobody wants to do that. I learned how to thread a starter rope when I was probably 9 or 10. Every kid should know how to do this. <laughs> of course, every kid of the 90s and prior, maybe not nowadays. I'm not even sure kids are allowed to mow lawns anymore. It's so sad. Hopefully it has enough spring tension to bring the whole thing in without going, oh yeah, look at that. That'll do it. So now I'm going to put my... Now I should disclaimer this by saying every starter mechanism from every manufacturer is different. Um, they really are. There's, there's so many different types of starters and just too many variables. So what works on this one probably won't work on... You know, I think Briggs and Stratton had like 50,000 different starter assemblies and they're all different and they all needed different techniques and different methods and all that crap. But this one's pretty straightforward. This is a, this is a Chinese engine. This is a Lonson, which is what Toro uses on their, um, on their snowblowers. And I think some of their heavier equipment, but nice, easy, nice little knot there. So there should be enough spring tension for on this snow thrower handle, which is a he snow throwers have these bigger handles on them because they're designed to be used while you're wearing gloves. So there should be enough spring tension to keep this in the uh, in its little home there in its little cup. And it's more than enough spring tension. Okay. I don't think I need to do any lubricant or lubricating in this. This is this is fine. Now, if a spring breaks, it's it's a different ball game. Um, shouldn't be too difficult, but spring breakages. Um, I think a lot of people just buy whole new starter assemblies when that happens, uh, because you can't always get the correct springs. Um, sometimes it's a little difficult. But we'll pop this back in, and we'll, our snowblower will have all the travel it needs. To start, the rope that it had um, prior, after that last breakage, this is how long the whole rope is, and it's just it's just not enough rope. But what ends up happening, see, is when you have just a short rope like this, um, when you're pulling it, sometimes you might pull it too enthusiastically, and what can happen is that rope bottoms out, and you can actually pull the knot out or, or actually damage you can damage this plastic pulley. Um, that's why I'm changing it. Uh, there's no other, I mean, I, I know it's short, but somebody could be helping me, you know, somebody could show up to the house while we're on vacation or something and snow blow for us. And they're thinking that this rope is gonna have, you know, a good five feet of travel, when in reality it only has three. And they could pull it quite hard. And um, and again, they could they could break this this pulley which would cost even more to fix. So changing out the rope cost me $4 and about 10 minutes of my time. And uh, doesn't... Now, it's also important that when your rope starts to fray, if you notice any fraying at all, just even a little bit, this one wasn't that bad when it broke. Just a little bit of fraying on it is all that it took to just cause it to just snap on me. Especially on a cold engine. Um, you know, the thing sits outside at 20 degree temperatures um, so it doesn't turn over so easy. So just kind of thought I'd mention that. So we're going to put this back on, and the snowblower will be ready for the 2021 season. Into 22. This came with the new rope. We're going to just throw this away. There's literally no reason to have that. Um, we have a we have the correct one already on there. So we did some pretty normal routine maintenance on the snowblower because it, on the lawnmower because it really needed it. Um, it's two, almost three years old and it's just time. And it had issues rolling around like it wouldn't roll that easily before. Now it's nice and it just glides along like it should. This machine gets really a very little use. Um, since I bought this thing back in 28, I think I bought it in um, December of 18. 
it hasn't had a ton of use. Um, you know, it's one of those, this is a machine that it just has to be at the ready when it's needed. And, you know, it doesn't get regular weekly use. Um, we might not use it for a month. Then all of a sudden we use it for four days in a row. I mean, it's just, it, snow is a lot less predictable than grass growing. So, um, you know, some storms don't require a snowblower at all. So the amount of maintenance that this machine gets is not nearly as intense as what that, that lawnmower uses or needs. So the belts, I mean, I'm not even worried about the belts. Um, you know, the engine is, it gets, it gets oil changes every year regardless of usage. Um, but this year, all I really did was I greased the, um, the axle shaft so that the wheels don't get stuck. That's something that you should know if you've never had a snowblower before. When you buy the machine new or buy it used, make sure you take the wheels off if you can and put some grease on the axles. Because what happens is rust can form between the axle and the wheel hub and it can cause the wheel to stick and you can't get it off easily. Um, I've seen machines get scrapped because it, was too co it wasn't cost effective to take the wheel off because it would damage the uh, axle and it's just a, it's happened, I've seen it happen before. Um, so that was the first thing I did. Um, I also went ahead and I adjusted my, I'll show you, I'm going to quickly describe what to do with these. Um, on most snow blowers, you want about a quarter of an inch for the blade. That's it, blade right there. That uh, see those where those bolts are. That is a replaceable blade, and what that is is it's designed to scrape up the snow from the ground and and um, and guide it into the impeller housing. Now, what happens is the shoe plates on either side they wear out or they're just not in, they're not properly adjusted from the factory and they do require periodic adjustment so what you do is you want to take I actually made my own adjustment stick this is a one quarter inch thick piece of wood and it's kind of a I just lay it across of course the floor is not perfectly level so but I lay it across the um, the ground or on the in this case the concrete floor and I set that blade right on top of that piece of wood and then I'm going to loosen up the shoes on both sides and let them kind of drop down to their natural height. They should be flat on the ground at, at, that, at that quarter inch adjustment. And then it tighten them up and the snowblower is ready to go. Um, but periodic readjustment is a good thing. Um, one thing that I found out recently is that snowblowers are now very, very expensive and hard to find. Um, this machine cost me 850, 850 US dollars back in December of 2018. This exact machine today sells for around $1,200 if you can find one. Um, it's, it's a crazy time we live in. <laughs> um, and the snowblowers that I'm able to find at that $850, $900 price range are absolute garbage. They're mostly MTD models and they're flimsy as all get up. I should have brought my camera to Home Depot with me today because, I mean, you pick you pick the machine up by the shroud or by the uh, floor housing and everything just bends and twists on those MTDs, those Craftsman's, the Troy Bilts, the Cub Cadets, they're all garbage. You pick it up like this, and the whole chassis flexes. You don't want that. The chassis should be rigid. Um, and that's what I like about these, these uh, Toro machines, is they're built solid. They're kind of built as strong as they used to be back in the 90s. Um, they're just better built overall. They have better gearboxes. Um, they have better wheels, better tires, better engines. They're just better machines um, than you get from Troy built. Craftsman, Cub Cadet, um, whatever other names they're selling them under too. Um, and, I, and if you own one of those machines, I'm not, I'm not trashing your decision to buy one. I mean, sometimes it's all you can find, and it's really a shame. But these Toros, when you can find one, and I, I, I made a couple of videos of this machine, and I think I've sold 
I probably sold a dozen of these um, just by making that video. A lot of folks have bought these machines on my recommendation and they were very happy with them. And um, But because of the supply chain issues and just general shittiness of the modern world we live in, um, but the only thing to ever go wrong with this one was that stupid rope. And I think what happened was, I'm not really sure how, but it was somehow, it, it was, it was chafing on something and I don't know what. Maybe it was, maybe it was that grommet right there, but there are no sharp edges on it. So it's just something I'm going to have to keep an eye on. Maybe there's a, maybe there's, there was a burr in the metal and uh, it just didn't get found and it destroyed my rope prematurely. I don't know. I'll have to keep an eye on that because that could be a big problem. But fortunately, it has an electric start backup, which I've only used once just to see if it worked. Um, the electric starter, you just plug an extension cord in right here and press this button. Again, I never use that feature, but it's there if I need it. So, um, oil change, I didn't do a plug in this because I don't, there's just not enough hours on this machine to, to warrant a, a plug replacement yet. Um, but oil changes, I don't skimp on those because it's cheap insurance. Um, belts, not worried about belts because again, there's no miles on this thing. It gets used, I think I used it three times last year. I mean, we really didn't get a lot of snow. Thank you, global warming, right? <laughs> it's a serious problem, but I'm trying to make light of a bad situation. But we haven't had a ton of snow and not nearly as much snow as I had when I lived up in the country. I live in a city now, probably a little warmer. It's lower elevation. We don't get as much snow. When I, where I used to live up in the condo, we got, when, when it snowed, it snowed. Um, but down here, not as much. So where I live now, you could get away with a little, um, uh, what they call a single stage machine. This is a double stage, dual stage and single stage. That's how they're usually sold. A single stage, it just has an impeller. I'm sorry, it has a, um, an auger that spins at a rapid speed, much faster than this. And what it does is it has the impeller built into the center of the, of the auger. And that, uh, that impeller, it's like a, like a, um, like a flat, uh, impeller that's that's the word to use um it looks like a paddle wheel and what it does is it sends that snow straight up to a, to a hole right about here where the chute is located um, on a double st or dual stage the auger's job is to break that snow up and pull it into the fast spinning impeller back there all that shiny greasy stuff is fluid film it prevents rust and it keeps it uh, it yeah, basically just keeps it from rusting. Um, and then when that wears off, um, after one or two storms, you can spray like a silicone in there and it keeps it nice and nice and uh, slick. So, as far as I know, I don't think there's an oil change interval in this gearbox. I think it might actually be full of uh, grease. But, um... Two issues that you want to look out for if you've got one of the MTD machines. I know this is true for the the um, the power steering models. On the power steering models, and it might be others as well, there is a plastic gearbox somewhere in the middle lower part of the machine. And that plastic gearbox is a transmission for all intents and purposes. It is a transmission with clutches and a lot of gears. And what happens is those wear out very quickly, often like after maybe two or three storm or two or three seasons, they go to hell. Um, I don't know if they've improved the design or not, but um, they cost more than the entire snowblower to repair. So keep that in mind if you've got one of those. Um, it's made, the gearbox is made by General Transmission who also makes the gearboxes and the Toro lawnmowers, which is, a, as I mentioned in our earlier part of the video, and it's a major weak spot on those too. The other problem, and this is actually coming from a guy I know who does um, power equipment repair and service. He said that on the MTD machines, this gearbox here has a very high failure rate. Um, they're brass gears, um, 
and the whole box is just full of grease. There's no service, no service interval on it. And what happens is those those are soft brass gears, and they do wear out. And um, again, that gearbox to pay somebody to replace that is going to cost you probably more than the machine's worth. Um, the reason I bought the Toro. It's because none of those are issues on this machine. The worst thing that's going to happen to this might have a bearing failure here and there, and it might have a, a drive wheel. The drive wheel on the um, on the variable speed, pull, uh, what, what do they call that, drive plate system, uh, those uh, rubber wheels are just a service item. They wear out and you replace them like belts. And um, I, I prefer those than a complicated transmission like they have in the MTDs. But um, the only issue I've had with this machine is its lowest speed isn't low enough. And I got into a, a, a discussion, a heated discussion with somebody, I believe, obviously on YouTube about this. And they just keep saying it's out of adjustment. It's not out of adjustment. And the only way, you, here's how you know it's not out of adjustment. If it goes, if, all right, if first gear, crawls first speed right here forward and the first position in reverse is true reverse it's well within adjustment um, because if you adjust it one way either way it's not if you adjust it too far forward it's going to go too fast in first speed and it's not going to go in reverse um, it's a very simple mechanism I I should pull the cover. I should, you know, what I should do in another video. I'll probably show you guys how to adjust that, and I'll show you what what's actually happening inside the the gearbox cover. Very simple mechanism. Not much to go wrong, and uh, requires very little maintenance. But um, other than replacing that uh, that rubber drive wheel when it wears out. Of course, I haven't shown you any of those parts, so you probably don't know what the hell I'm talking about if this isn't something you're familiar with. But anyway, the other maintenance I've done to this, I did this, uh, did it, I think, last at the end of last season, as I spray fluid film in all the pivots up inside here in the uh, in the stick control ball. Where did I let go? It just shut off on me. Just spray all that up in with WD-40 with um <laughs> with fluid film, and it's actually kept everything moving nice and nice and well. You don't want to spray it on any of the components in the transmission box because that would be, that would actually cause the rubber drive wheel to slip, which would be kind of stupidly bad. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> I think that's going to conclude our video. The uh, annual maintenance of all of my power equipment, which, <laughs> hey, it's something to do, right? It's all part of being a, being a, uh, homeowner or apartment dweller where you have to do the lawn maintenance and the yard maintenance you gotta you gotta take care of your equipment and it will take care of you unless it says mtd on the label but anyway <laughs> until then have a great day